Chapter 40 They watch Stan disappear into Pancho Pirelli's caravan. Would you like to eat? growls the boar man from the counter of the wild boar cookhouse. Eat what? says Clarence P. Chops, growls the boar man. Or a sausage or three. Or a burger, perhaps. What is they made of? asks Clarence P. Best boar, of course, growls the boar man. He leans towards them. You look like a bunch of upright fellas. You look like fellas that'd benefit from chomping on the boar. We certainly is fellas of a different caliper from others what we have seen in this place, agrees Clarence P. Then come and eat. There's plenty here for all of you. Clarence P and the lads stand at the counter of the wild boar cookhouse. They chomp on the delicious boar meat. Is it tasty? asks the boar man. It is delicious, mumbers Alf. Is it making you hairy? Hairy, says Doug. Aye, hairy like a boar, like in the tail. In what tail? asks Fred. In the tail about the man that ate the boar. Shall I tell you it? No, sir, says Clarence P. We is not interested in silly tales. We is interested in truth and facts. Then shall I tell you the truth about the man that ate the boar? No. He turned into a boar himself, growls the boar man. That, sir, says Clarence P, sounds distinctly like a tale. Perhaps it is. Perhaps the truth and the tale about the man and the boar is all one thing. Perhaps the truth and the tale about anything is all one thing. Should we do him, boss? ask Fred and Ted. Aye, snarls the boar man, opening his jaws and showing his teeth. Aye, do it now. But before you do, did you hear the tale about the man that had no tails? No, sir. A tail came along and gobbled him up. And the boar man jumps up onto his counter and opens his jaws again and roars. Chapter 41 Back we go to the traffic lights at the end of the road into town. The lights are red. The traffic's at a halt. The policeman's standing there, of course, watching out for wickedness and fishiness. A tractor pulling a cart full of hay draws up. The driver turns in his seat and calls behind him. It's the end of the road, you two. The policeman hears and he watches. Two figures clamber down from the cart. They're stumbling, stick-like figures, like scarecrows. Thank you, sir, they call to the driver. Thank you, kind sir. Think now of it. Glad to be of service, answers the driver. The lights turn green. The traffic moves on. The policeman grins. What have we here, he thinks, as he proceeds towards the scarecrow pair with his hands behind his back. The ugly grin turns to a tender smile upon his face. Good evening, he says, ever so polite. Good evening, sir, say Annie and Ernie, for of course it is they. Welcome to our modest town, says the policeman, and what might you be after in this place? Oh, sir, says Ernie, we are searching for a lost boy. A poor ickle lost boy, replies the policeman. Yes, sir, says Annie, he is a good boy, sir. He is this tall, and he has a bonny face, and there is goodness glowing from his eyes. I don't suppose you have... Goodness, says the policeman. I see many boys in the course of my work, but not too many who have goodness glowing from them. Then you would know him easily, sir, says Ernie. The policeman ponders. He strokes his cheek, scratches his head. No, he murmurs. I recall a high degree of wickedness, but how is it, if I may ask, that you came to lose him? Ernie looks down at the pavement. Oh, sir, he says, I have only myself to blame. I did not treat him right. He ran away. He ran away? And yet you tell me that he is a good boy? Can a runaway ever be a good boy? Oh, yes, sir, cries Annie. And what is more, can those who do not treat their children right be good themselves? No, sir, whispers Ernie, but I have seen the errors of my ways and I have changed. Too late, snaps the policeman. Your wickedness has been unleashed upon the world. We have an evil runaway in our midst. 
Now you follow him and think the world will be all lovey-dovey to you. It will not. I should take you away this very minute and slap you in my darkest cell. Oh, please, no, sir, begs Annie. What did you expect? asks the policeman. Did you think I would escort you to the nearest five-star hotel? Did you expect to be offered jacuzzi baths and handmade chocolates and four-poster beds? Oh, no, sir, says Annie. We do not want luxuries. Luxuries? I'll give you luxuries. The policeman points across the road to the narrow lane opposite. Get out of my sight, he snarls, before I slap the cuffs on you. Follow that lane. You'll be at home down there with the rest of the raggle-taggle lot. You'll find plenty of holes to hide in and ditches to kip in. Go a bit further and you'll even find a river to fling yourselves in. His eyes glitter in the sinking light. If I so much as catch a glimpse of you two again... Annie and Ernie scuttle across the road. They dodge the traffic. They enter the potholed lane. The policeman sniggers as he watches them go. Oh, how he loves his work. A nasty man, says Ernie. Maybe he's just had a difficult day, says Annie. She takes Ernie's arm and they stumble together through the darkness down the lane. You're right, dear, says Ernie. Maybe he's just had a very difficult day. Chapter 42 One by one and million by million the stars start to shine. The pale moon brightens. All across the fairground field the lights begin to flicker, flash and glow. The people scream and laugh in the cooling air. The music thuds and wails and shrieks. Many make their way in hushed excitement to a place that seems more still than any other. A place where a simple wheeled trailer stands with a tarpaulin draped across its front, bearing the simple words, Stanley Potts. A floodlight shines upon the scene, and a spotlight makes a circle of brightness upon the blue tarpaulin, a circle that awaits the performer. The crowd gathers and grows. People eat popcorn and crisps and candy floss. They eat sugary rock in the shape of little walking sticks and moulded into plates of English breakfast. They chew on chops and boar burgers. They swig beer and lemonade and bottles of black pop. Where is he? is the whisper. Where is Stanley Potts? Have you seen him yet? Nobody has, for Stanley is in Pancho Pirelli's caravan. He's looking at photographs of Pancho as a boy. He's looking at the great changes that came upon that boy and turned Pancho into the man he is today. He's looking further back in time to the great Pedro Perdito. This is his ancestry. This is the line of history that leads to him, to Stanley Potts. And Stanley shakes a little and trembles. Nervous, Stan? says Pancho. Yes, admits the boy. Scared they'll eat you up? Scared it's the day of doom? Stan ponders, then shakes his head. No, he says. He trembles again, and suddenly, I'm scared of something, but I don't know what. Then he knows. I'm just scared of doing it in front of all those folk, Mr. Pirelli. Then he knows some more. And I'm scared of changing. I'm scared of becoming a different Stanley Potts. Pancho smiles. I know the feeling. As for doing it in front of all those folk, it's only natural to be nervous, and a bit of nervousness will help you to perform. As for changing, what happens is you'll not be a completely different Stanley Potts. You'll be the new and the old Stanley all at once. You'll be the Stan of Hooker Duck, the Stan of the Days in Fish Key Lane, and you'll be the brand new Stan who swims with the piranhas. Be all those things together at once, and that's where your real greatness will be. Stan listens to the great Pancho Pirelli. He allows his memories to gather in his mind. His faded visions of his time as a toddler with his mum and dad. He sees himself walking hand in hand with Uncle Ernie and Auntie Annie by the shipyards and the glittering river. He recalls the fish canning factory and all the torments there. He remembers the goldfish, the tender thirteenth fish, and Dostoevsky, Natasha, and the hooker duck. He brings them all into his mind, and they flow together there. And he brings to his mind the piranha tank, and the fish, and their teeth, and their graceful dancing. 
and he realises that his memories in his mind are astonishing things. And he looks at Pancho Pirelli and he calmly says, I'm ready, Mr Pirelli. Let's go out to the tank. Chapter 43 Suddenly there's Stan, stepping into the spotlight beneath his name. He wears his cape, his trunks, his goggles. He wears a look of calm determination on his face. There are gasps of excitement and delight. Children squeal. It's him, the whisper goes. It's Stanley Potts. Him, say some. That scrawny little fella there. That can't be him. It is. He's too little. It is. He's too scrawny. It is. He's too young. That can't be the Stanley Potts. Pancho Pirelli steps into the spotlight at Stanley's side. The voices hush. This, says Pancho, is Stanley Potts. So it is, they say. I told you, they say. Pancho raises his hand and there's silence. He draws aside the tarpaulin and there they are, swimming through the beautiful illuminated water, the awful fishy fiends, the dreadful devils with teeth like razors and jaws like traps. And these, says Pancho, are my piranhas. There are squeaks and squeals and gasps and groans. Pancho raises his hand again. Ladies and gentlemen, he whispers, you are about to see something wondrous. You are about to see something that will live forever in your dreams. More squeaks and squeals and gasps and groans. But first of all, says Pancho, you must get your money out and you must pay. Stan stays standing in the spotlight as Pancho steps into the crowd holding out his velvet bag. Pancho murmurs his thanks as coins drop into the bag. He mutters encouragement. Dig deeper, sir. Perhaps a little more, madam. That's better. Much better. Oh, thank you. You are very kind. He voices his disappointment. Is that really all you will give? You expect so much for such a pittance? He seeks out the reluctant ones. I can see you. You can't escape the eyes of Pancho Pirelli. Money is what we need. Please give it now. Once or twice his voice is raised as if in anger. Do you realise that a boy is about to risk his life for your entertainment? And all the time the murmurs of excitement grow. From the back of the crowd, from the shadows between two caravans, five pairs of eyes watch. Five pairs of eyes that belong to five burly blokes dressed in black. What's going to happen, boss? asks one of the blokes. Something of the deepest, darkest fishiness, says Clarence P. He points to Stan. I should have known what that monster in the spitlight would get up to. We should have put a stop to him way back in Fish Key Lane. I can see you, you know, says Pancho, weaving his way through the crowd towards them. There's no need to hide in the dark. No need to be shy, gentlemen. We is not shy, says Clarence P. We is watching with our eyes peeled. We is the investigators of all things fishy. And there is something fishy here. Indeed there is, agrees Pancho. There is something very, very fishy here. I knowed it, says Clarence P. It is a nutter disgrace. We is here to put a stop to it. Put a stop to what, says Pancho. To what is going to happen, says Clarence P. And what is that, asks Pancho. Clarence P. narrows his eyes. Do not try to bamboozle Clarence P. Clap, Mr. Moneybags. I know your tricks and they will not work with me. Pancho smiles. He moves into the shadows closer to Clarence P. He puts his arm around Clarence P's shoulder. Do not be frightened, Mr. Clap, he says. Or may I call you Clarence? You may not, says Clarence P. Unhand me, Mr. Moneybags. Clarence P. Clap is never frightened, says Fred. 
No, says Pancho. Then perhaps he would like to enter the tank. The lads look at Clarence P. His eyes glitter in the moonlight. Unhand me, I said, he cries. This is all a tissue of lies and darkness and bumboozlements. Is it now? says Pancho. It is. That boy is a devil, and you, sir, is a slippery fish have I ever seen one. Pancho laughs. <laughs> and them fish there, says Clarence P, pointing to the tank. Them fish there, says Pancho, is not what you said they is, finishes Clarence P. Not piranhas, says Pancho. They is not. Let me clarify, Clarence. Pancho points towards Stan and the fish tank. That boy over there is one of the bravest boys you will ever see. And those fish over there are some of the fiercest fish you will ever see. And that boy is about to swim with those fierce fish. Fred snorts. <coughs> that squirt, he says. And them tiddlers. Yes, says Pancho. I can have that squirt for me dinner. I put them tiddlers for me pudding, scoffs Ted. And drink the water for me soup, asks Doug. Perhaps you should try it, Pancho tells them. Come with me to the tank. Stick a finger in. Aha, says Clarence P. Do not listen, lads. Mr Moneybags is trying to tempt you and lead you into fishy waters. It is all tricks and fakery. There is no rhyme nor raisin to it. And we has no wish to take part in such a spectacle, sir. Unhand me and be off. We will be watching. One sign of fishness and we will down on it like a ton of bricks. The lads laugh and begin to gather around Pancho. Tiny tiddlers, they grunt. They're about to grab him, but he's gone, weaving his way once more through the crowd. Be strong, lads, says Clarence P. We is one of the world's dark, dark places. We is in the middle of the land of wreck and ruin. Watch and listen and learn. The lads peer at Pancho, at Stan, at the crowd, at the fish swimming sweetly in the illuminated tank. One day, lads, declares Clarence P, all darkness will be drove out from the world. There'll be no daft places like this, no daft people like these around us, no daft fishy tanks and no daft fishy goings on. Well, I'll be good, boss, says Alf. It will, agrees Clarence P. So there'll just be people like us, says Doug. Aye, says Fred. People what knows what's what. Correct, says Ted. Undaft people who knows what's what in a world what's got no daftness in it. Well said, Ted, said Clarence P. I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs>